something magical that happened. So number one, congratulations. You know, as Carl said, uh, you know, kind of the intent behind this meeting, he used the word to slingshot. And as I was thinking, what's the right word for me? And before he used that word, it was catapult. You know, in some way, if we could just catapult you guys out of this meeting. Jeremy talked about Bonnie last year, who came to this as a two-star diamond coach. She's an elite 10 coach, 15-star diamond. I mean, why not you, okay? Uh, success leaves clues. There's going to be an opportunity. It's going to be sprinkled over the next 24 hours that you're going to be able to pick up, but then you got to run with it. you got to do something with that. So uh, excited to be here. Now listen, uh, as I talk to a group, one of the first things I like to do is I like to kind of know who the audience is, and I really like to get a sense how smart the audience is, okay? Because then it lets me gauge my, how I'm talking, okay? So, so I've got a little test for everybody, okay? Now there's gonna be some rules to the test, and following the rules is the first part of it, how smart you really are, okay? I'm gonna put a sentence up on the screen. What your job is is to read the sentence. There is no talking, okay? There's no nudging, there's no whispering. This is just you and the screen and me, okay? Just this intimate moment. Okay, it'll be absolutely fantastic. So I'm gonna let you read this sentence. Everybody just read the sentence. I'll give you time to read it once or twice, okay? And then I'm gonna stop, okay? Does everybody understand the rules? Okay, so that's a good test. Some of you said no. I'm looking at the corporate team over here and they're totally confused, so that doesn't bode well. Okay, ready, here we go. Here is the, um, here's the sentence. Everybody read that to yourselves. Okay, I'm gonna, everybody's got it maybe through once or twice, right? Okay, so, um, everybody read the sentence? Okay, so everybody understood all the words to the sentence? Okay, nothing surprising there, anything like that? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the same sentence and I want you to do something, and again, I don't want you to talk, okay? So as you read the sentence this time, I want you to count the number of Fs in the sentence, okay? And I wanna keep that to yourself, not too difficult. Okay, here we go. No tricks about this. Okay, everybody had a chance to count the number of Fs? Everybody's going, maybe, okay? <laughs> maybe. Okay, everybody look at me now, okay? So just, now this is a time when we participate, okay? So um, just by show up, by just maybe a couple of you to just yell out, how many of you, or by show of hands, how many saw um, two Fs? Or at least, at least, just only two Fs in the sentence. How many saw three? Okay, look around, three, now be proud. Hold your hand up, how many saw three Fs in the sentence? Okay, um, how many saw four Fs in the sentence? Okay, there's a few more. Okay, same sentence, how many saw five Fs in the sentence? Really? Okay, how many saw six Fs in the sentence? Okay, look around. There's people that are seeing different things than other people are seeing. Okay, did anybody see more than six Fs in this sentence? Okay, now look around. Okay, so we, did anybody see one F, only one? Okay, so how many of you are absolutely confident when you look at this sentence, if we were to go back, Dave, can you, or can you go back to that slide? Okay, as you look at that, give you one more chance to look at it. Count the number of Fs. Okay. So how many people still, now let's be honest, okay? How many people still only see three Fs? No one's gonna hold their hand up. How, it's a few, there's the honest group over here. How many people see four? How many see five? How many don't see six Fs? Or seven Fs? How many don't see F7? Okay, let me help a little bit. Same sentence, right? All smart people. So here we go. Um, finished files are the result of, of, scientific, of, and of. Okay, so does everybody, now let me ask, does everybody see the seven Fs? Sandy's going to shoot this with the SEC 7. Arnold's still struggling. You can help him out. Oh, 
Paris, it's the French. Okay, why do this? Okay, just obviously um, a little bit of fun. But, but what happens when we come to these types of meetings? We all, we all know what F's look like. We all know what that letter looks like. But we always don't see them. They're not always obvious to us. And while we're here together, this is an opportunity for us to see some of the obvious things in our business, to give greater focus to them. And when we have Michelle and Bonnie and Melanie and others that are speaking to you, they're gonna be pointing out some of these things that are gonna jump out that you need to be paying attention to and incorporating into your business. Carl talked about professionalizing your business. Professionalizing your business. If you want hobby results from your business, then don't do that. If you want great results from your business, then you're going to have to take it up a notch. And so for the next few minutes, what I want to do is I want to talk about some ways that I believe that you can professionalize your business. And um, one of my favorite books, business books uh, in the entire world, some of you have heard me probably talk about this before, is the book called Good to Great. It's the author's Jim Collins. Uh, it's the study of how good companies become great. And the thing that's cool about this book is although it's a study about companies, it's really not. It's a study about people because people make up companies. So in order to have great companies, you've got to have great people within that organization. But not everybody makes that transition. Not everybody's able to do that. Not everyone's able to transcend, if you will, the curse of competence, okay, of just being competent. Why aren't there more great companies? Because we're happy being good. Good's comfortable. It's better than most. Uh, it, it, it requires effort to be more than that. But there's a science and there's clues that can help you as you grow your business. And so what I want to do over the next few minutes and plant some seeds in your mind is some of the principles behind what it might take in your business to transition from being a good coach, okay, a good CEO, to some things that over time will help you become a great CEO. And the cool thing about this as well, I believe that these principles apply to your life as an individual as much as they do to your business. So there's just like these double wins. And the more that you're congruent in those pieces, the better off you are in life. So I'm gonna just talk about a couple of these, of these pieces uh, tonight, this afternoon. The first is, and I'm skipping over some that the book introduces, so if you were to go look at the book, you'd see there's some other, some other areas. But one of the pieces that they found that great companies did is that they were willing to confront the brutal facts of their reality. That they were able to look at themselves, to be self-aware, to be accountable, to be able to recognize those, and to take the time and be thoughtful and say, where am I in my business? What is the reality of our business? As you look at your business, what you have to do is look at it and ask yourself, what are the realities? What's the state of my business? What's the state of my leadership? Are the people that are on my team today going to be the ones that really take me where I want to go? You know, are they discount coaches, but I'm really expecting them to be my next diamonds and star diamonds? You know, you're, you're, you're misaligned there. Um, are there other realities in your life? There may be relationship or business issues or competency issues or whatever those might be, whatever affects your business, you have to be willing to be thoughtful enough and accountable enough to sit back and say, where am I in my business? As I listen to many of the great coach stories that have been very successful, it always seems like there's this baseline this clear understanding that they have of where they are in their lives and what the reality looks like. But they also bring to the table not this sense of doom or this sense of discouragement or this sense of whatever it is that's gonna take them down. They still bring this sense of hope and optimism to their business. But once they understand the brutal facts, that gives them up, they can start to dissect the issue and create a game plan. The book talks about what they refer to the Stockdale Paradox, and this makes, a, makes the point of how, how to deal with this. Um, it's called the Stockdale Paradox because it, was, it refers to James Stockdale, who was a rear admiral uh, in the Navy, he was an Air Force pilot, not Air Force, he was a Navy pilot, that crashed in Vietnam, spent seven years, eight years, in the Hanoi Hilton, which was a prison in Vietnam. Um, he was one of the most respected 
prisoners of war ever. He developed these, these communication systems, this way, um, despite being tortured over 20 times, to never give in to the situation. His men loved him. Uh, he, was just, he received the Medal of Honor upon returning home. And as they took, as they started to interview him and say, how did you deal with this situation? He said this, and I thought this is such a great line. He said, he said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. Despite my situation, I never lost faith in the end of my story, despite everything that was happening. And they asked him, they said, well, so who didn't make it out of this horrible situation, out of this, out of this prison camp? And he said, he thought for a minute, and then he said, the optimists. And he said, the optimists? He said, why the optimists? He said, because they never confronted the reality of their situation. They were always going to get out at Easter. They were going to get out at Christmas. Someone was going to rescue them. And they never grappled with the reality of what their situation was. And so he makes this point that you have to confront the brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be, but you always have to retain faith that you will prevail in the end regardless of the difficulties. Regardless of the difficulties. And again, if I could throw an umbrella over this piece in confronting the brutal facts, it was never lose sight or never lose faith in the end of the story. And do you know what that end of the story looks like in your business? Um, so confronting the brutal facts to me is, is honestly not a discouraging piece. It shouldn't be something that, that takes you down because honestly, it's like a before and after picture in your business. You know, one of the worst things, one of the harshest realities in your business when you think about it is when you step in front of that mirror and you really look at yourself and you, you know, you take your shirt off, you know, you kind of go, I'm looking pretty good. And then when you take that picture and you look at yourself and you're going, uh, someone else, you know, uh, that's, but but that's a little bit of what this is Taking a snapshot of your business creating a baseline creating a starting point and building from there The next point and I move quickly here is that what they refer to as the hedgehog concept And this is really the center of much of what this book is all about You're saying why would they call it the hedgehog concept? They call it the hedgehog concept because it's, it's based on a fable from Isaiah Berlin. Who, you don't need to worry about who that is. But he talks about the story of the hedgehog and the fox. The fox is smart, cunning, quick, good-looking, sleek, uh, you know, just very crafty in everything it does. The hedgehog, kind of slow, kind of dowdy, doesn't move too quickly, but he does one thing very well. As the hedgehog, or as the fox tries all these different maneuvers, these different ways every single day to catch the hedgehog, the hedgehog knows and senses the dangers coming from the fox, and he does something very simple. He rolls up into a ball with his little porcupine quills that go out, and he protects himself. He does one thing very, very well. Instead of chasing all sorts of different strategies, bright, shiny objects in the business, what the next best thing is in the business. He focuses on one thing and does it extremely well. And it's really in determining what those pieces are, they focused on three different elements. One, the first was what you can be very best in the world at. Now you may be looking at yourself and saying, I'm never gonna be the very best in the world at anything. But you can be the very best in your world, okay? Um, I believe, for what it's worth, that each one of us, you, come into this world, you know, with, with a divine DNA, a God-given gift, or just these strengths, whatever you want to refer to them as, that, that are buried in there. And sometimes we have to dust them off, we have to get the rust off of those things, and discover what those strengths are, okay? But it's more than just discovering those strengths, it's, they have to intersect with what are you deeply passionate about, and the third is, what will drive your economic engine? Because you can be something that you're best in the world about, but you're not passionate about, or it may not drive your economic engine. And what you have to look at your business and look at yourself as is, is what do I do well? And take the time to identify that. Now, you can't stop. You can't take your foot off the gas. You have to keep moving. It's an iterative process. I was talking to Kim the other day about this. He said, Jeff, you need to be careful because if you start talking too much about what you're best in the world at, you know, they're going to stop and they're going to spend two years you know, going to a mountain to find peace and clarity and, and you know, all that kind of a thing. And I said, maybe not. You know, because it is an iterative process 
of, of learning. And you have to keep figuring that piece out. But the other piece that I think is key here is what drives your economic engine. And Carl talked about this, and I'm referring to the Beachbody business, obviously. But when you think about what your economic engine really is at Beachbody, okay, I think sometimes our coaches are a little bit myopic in that they'll, if just from a sheer retailing standpoint, where they just go, I'm just gonna get, like Carl says, sometimes chase the money, chase the dollar, okay, type of thing, chase the wealth too quickly. But that's not gonna drive your long-term economic engine. What drives your economic engine at a company like us is the ability to give people results, to have them be committed and loyal to our nutritional products, to getting fitness in their life, and doing that month after month after month. That there's a long-term sustainability. And so you have to understand that that's what's gonna drive your business. That's what's going to drive your economic engine. And the skill sets that you develop and the strength that you develop have to align with that. And it should be, almost has to be, it has to be something that you're passionate about. Okay? Not that you want to be passionate about, not that you want to be the best in the world about, but what you can be because of who you are and what really does give you passion. And then you've got to bring those pieces together. And when companies did that, that's when they started to really evolve. When people did that, that's when they started to transition from good to great companies. And then what it allowed them to do, once they had great clarity in their business and strict discipline around those, then they would form the BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals that let them go to great places, whether that's elite, whether it's top 10, whether whatever that is, on that big, hairy, audacious goal that motivates you, that pushes you, that inspires you, that's what's going to make that knowing your hedgehog is the piece that will, that will exponentially increase your ability to achieve that. My bet, if I were to bring Melanie up here and I were to bring Ms. Bonnie up here and we started to dissect what they were doing, that you would start to find these hedgehog concepts of what they do. We had dinner last night. It was so interesting to talk to them about, we were talking about when do you get in the system? When do you turn this over to these people? And I think it was Michelle Myers actually that said to Bonnie, she said, once you, you're gonna see, once you turn this over to them, stuff you don't have passion about, but the things that you do really well, that's when your business goes up. That's when you're excited about your business. You know, and you start doing the things that you do very, very best. But this piece is so key to your success. The next is, moving quickly, is this concept of having a disciplined culture. Okay. When Carl talks about professionalizing your business, this can't be haphazard, it can't be sloppy, it can't be, I'll get to it when I get to it. Um, and when you listen to these national wake-up calls that Sandy puts together for us, and she selects these speakers, and I, I, again, I, I'm going to pick on the ones that we've got here, not pick on them, point them out, highlight them. But as we, Bonnie spoke just this last Monday, Melanie was on three weeks ago, you know, just three weeks ago, one of the points that they continually made was that they are thoughtful about what they do in their business, okay? When they get to the beginning of the week, they are thoughtful and they are disciplined and they schedule their time. I know that Melanie's gonna talk about some time management, but they are disciplined around what they do. That then transfers to the people around them and it transfers to the action that you've got to take. And the, it, it, it's really this idea almost, when you look about discipline, it, it's more about what you stop doing than what you start doing. When you think about it, if you start doing too many things, you're gonna come out of this conference, and what's gonna happen is you're gonna go, Bonnie said this, Bonnie said this, Melanie said this, Michelle said this, and I heard this from these guys, and you're gonna go, your head's gonna be exploding. Your hair's gonna be on fire, and your head's gonna be exploding, and you're gonna wanna go a hundred different directions. The most valuable time that you can take when you get out of here is to take some time to just synthesize and to get very, very clear on the pieces that you're going to stop doing and the pieces that you're going to focus on that align very, very clearly with what your hedgehog concept is and that are going to provide the greatest results in your business. Not the stuff you like to do, but the stuff that you need to do in order to get 
great results from your business. That's what discipline is all about. The three vital behaviors, they're, they're not just there because they're cute, okay? Um, they're there because they are the core drivers to success in your business. If you engage in those activities and are strictly disciplined around those, those are the pieces executed well that will bring you great results. This is a people business of sharing. You have to become a master about inviting and sharing, about building relationships, about following up. You just, there's no way around that in your, in your business. The culture of discipline, and the cool thing about this is, you do this, it will trickle down to your team. You do this, people want to be with you because they look at a person who's disciplined and is doing things they're not doing, that they want to draft off you, they want to learn from you, they want to best practice off you. That's how you build your team. That's how, that's how teams grow. That's how you become an attractor in the business. Not because you're just mediocre, because you're good. It's because you've learned to be great. I love the story they tell in this book about a guy named Dave Scott. Dave Scott was a six-time Ironman triathlete uh, the, in the Hawaii Marathon. For training, what he would do is he would bike a minimum of 70 miles, 75 miles a day. He would swim 12 miles a day, and he would, he would run 17 miles a day. He would burn over 5,000 calories okay, each day. Okay. He believed in a kind of a high carb diet. I mean, the, the guy was kind of a machine like to, to do this so well, he had to be doing something like. But one thing he did to introduce a culture of discipline into his own life was he would eat cottage cheese. But he wouldn't just eat cottage cheese, he would rinse his cottage cheese. He would rinse any of the excess fat off of it. And there was nothing that showed that rinsing his cottage cheese really contributed to his success as a world-class triathlete. But in his mind, what it did was it gave him that mental edge of discipline, that he was doing that little bit extra to give him the psychological edge that would help him be more successful. If I could wave the magic wand over you guys and say one of the things I'd love you to do as you walk out of here, and you think about your culture of discipline. How are you choosing to rinse your cottage cheese? What's that, what's that little bit extra that you're willing to do in your business that's gonna give you the psychological edge, but that speaks to other people that lets you know you're willing to do the things that you need to? So personally, I've made that same commitment. So with mine, this is my form of cottage cheese. I don't put as many pecans on my Cinnabon now, okay? So it's the high equivalent of rinsing. That was supposed to be more funny than that. Um, but anyway, um, I love the comments. The last piece is this. This is so critical as you build your business, is the flywheel effect. And I don't even know how many people even know what a flywheel is. But what a flywheel is, in the old days, it was this great big, huge, heavy wheel. If you think of the old movies with the locomotive trains, you know, where they, it takes this while for the, for the wheel to get going, and it's you know, kind of that chug, that slow moving. And, and it takes a lot of pushing to get that wheel going, but slowly over time, the momentum starts to build um, on, this, on this flywheel. The great companies, the good companies found that there was never one fell swoop, no one single defining action or a grand program or a killer innovation or some piece of technology or got real lucky, okay, in building a great company. What they did was they took their hedgehog concept, they took their culture of discipline, and they started to apply that to the business bit by bit over time, and pushed and pushed and continued to do those same things that created success in their business. This is a business that is not a complex business, okay? It really is a simple business. It's a challenging business. It's a tough business. It's a business of repetition, and the coaches and the businesses that have been the most successful are those that have figured out how to do those critical pieces in their business and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. It always amazes me when I, Carl talked about the wealth, chasing, chasing wealth. 
Um, as I look and do the national wake up calls, oftentimes I'll look at how much money people are making and what the, kind of what their growth trajectory is. And more often than not, it, there's, this, there's this kind of a pattern of this three year buildup, it seems like, where the first year may not be all that great. Second year might be a little better. And then all of a sudden there seems to be this trajectory if they've continued to do the right things. That's the flywheel effect in play. So as you listen to these coaches talk to you over the next several days, and you start to identify what the critical pieces of driving your business are, know that as Carl said, you gotta be here a year from now. You gotta make a commitment to be here two years from now. And you're gonna have to continue to push that flywheel. Not very sexy, not very exciting, okay? Not very glamorous, but that's where the success is built. It looks a little bit like this. I think this is a great video from Under Armour. Uh, many of you may know who Misty Copeland is, uh, a, a black ballerina that had no chance of dancing, but has become a world-class ballerina. Arena. Some of you may know who Jordan Spieth is, one of the youngest golfers, PJ, PGA champion, US Open's champion, has set all sorts of records, earned all sorts of money, and, um, Who's the three-point shooter, Darwin, on the Golden State? Steph. Steph Curry, sorry, I know Steph Curry. And Steph Curry, this little guy who's just fast. But these guys are world-class. They've transitioned from the curse of confidence to being great in their business. But this is what it looks like. Run the video. transition their businesses and their lives to being truly great. And I don't know why it can't be every single one of you. We're excited for this next couple of days. We're excited for these presenters that are absolutely phenomenally incredible, and that's probably underselling it. But uh, let's make this an absolute great uh, couple of days here. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.